listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. A look at President Trump's trade and economics, America's debt addiction circles the drain, Bitcoin mempool peaks as holiday shopping ramps up, and Ethereum trains a dragon. All this and more on episode 183 here on Wednesday, November 23rd, 2016. Darren? JJ, in the traditional markets, we have gold drops again to $1,188. Uh, silver drops to sixteen dollars and thirty four cents. Oil uh, is up to forty seven dollars and ninety four cents a barrel. Dow Jones rises to a record high of nineteen thousand and eighty three points. Uh, the thirty year Treasury continues to t- climb with a yield over three point zero two percent, and the euro is down slightly, t- trading at uh, one dollar and six cents. Uh, the Chinese yuan falls to 14 cents on the U.S. dollar. And Which is kind of deceptive because it's always yeah. been falling. It's just always been at that sort of mark where you still say 15 and it's, well, anyway. Right, right. So maybe we need another decimal point there. Yeah, perhaps. And the British pound is trading at $1.24. Uh, $1. Excellent. In, well, in yep. the crypto markets, we got Bitcoin at 741 is pretty stable. Uh, Litecoin is relatively stable as well at $3.89. Uh, Zcash is down to $84.88. Dash is down $8.40. Ethereum down to $9.67. Monero is up, recovering. Uh, you remember it was it was up near $10. It dropped down to about $4 in some sense. Now it's back up to $7.75. And Augur's rep tokens are down to $4.43. Darren, uh, one doge is equal to how much? One doge. Excellent. Incredible. And uh, Zcash is jumping around. It's really been all over the place. It changes quite a bit each and every day. So uh, just a reminder, you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and like lots, lots more. Excellent. And it's uh, always good to see what's going on with the new places, the new new channels. So if you're listening to us from a new channel, uh, you know, and you want to you want to let us know how it's going, you want to just give us some feedback, uh, please send us an email. And Darren's email is Darren at NeocashRadio.com. JJ's JJ at NeocashRadio.com. And we have yet to get Randy an email. Cool. But um, if you're on a new location and you haven't yet, this is your first show, please, we're trying to interact more with people, email us, even if you've already emailed, emailed us, uh, get in touch. Or uh, hit us up on Twitter or Facebook, we're That's at true. Neocash Radio. That's true. We, ha- we have those places as well, too. Uh, starting out the debt in America, now this isn't consumer debt and the fact that people are borrowing or, or uh, business debt. No, what we're talking about the actual debt of the government. Isn't that right, Randy? Yeah. So according to data released by the U.S. Treasury Department last week, the U.S. national debt has soared by a staggering $294 billion in the first 45 days of the 2017 fiscal year, uh, which is an annualized increase of 13%. So if it continues at this rate, the national debt could actually increase by $2.4 trillion uh, this fiscal year, uh, which would surpass $21 trillion by September 2017. So in the same fiscal year last year, the the national debt grew by more than one point three trillion dollars. Well, this is putting a big uh, anchor on those coming to. Will anybody actually pay this debt? I mean, that's my my big question. Can can you even pay this debt? It's Look. enslavement of future generations. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. When you're paying for things now and adding interest onto it, you're you're basically shackling future generations to pay this off and to pay off uh, even more because the interest is so outrageous. Um, the, the, the U S empire has grown the debt by more than a hundred million dollars an hour, every hour, every day since Obama has entered office and our kids and grandkids are going to have to pay, you know, th- might have to pay for all of that. So or, what's, what is the, uh, go ahead, dear. Or there could be a default, which, uh, I, I believe that's more and more likely yeah. as this debt gets higher and higher and, uh, we're seeing the yield increase and those two things together can, can lead to. A, a debt that honestly can't be paid back. Okay, okay, here's a serious question. How is this debt hell? I mean, wh- when when we say this debt, okay, and, and we're reading the story and we're saying this huge number that most yeah. people can't even comprehend. Is it is it is it treasury notes? Is it held in bonds? I mean, how is this debt actually uh, actualized? Most of it's uh, treasury notes. Uh, some foreign investors buy treasury notes, and sometimes bank buy t- treasury notes, and. Uh, Sometimes treasury notes can be divided up and uh, 
your typical person at the bank could buy a bond. And uh, there, there's a few different types. Uh, the types I remember are an I bond and a double E bond. And those are for smaller amounts. Treasury bonds usually go for $10,000 a pop, uh, or at least the base assets, $10,000. And uh, I bonds you can get for $100 or $50. or that, That's the ones you put in your savings deposit box for your kid's college or something like that. And um, so, but, but uh, basically it's all treasuries. Uh, the I bonds and the e, double E bonds basically are just parts of treasury bills. Uh, so, my understanding. so, okay, this first line that Randy uh, reported to us, the, uh, the $294 billion in the first 45 days. So what that means is that in the first 45 days, the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury created bonds equal to $294 billion and they sold those. Is that, is that, am yes, I interpreting that right? But they also might have, inc- um, and made more than those many bonds and retired some as well. Okay. So, so the amount they're creating is more. It's two hundred ninety-four billion more than what they retired. Right. And every every day they're retiring bonds that have yeah. either matured or yeah, basically they mature and they don't they don't have a choice. They can either default or pay out the okay. mature amount. Well, so the average rate of interest paid on U.S. government debt has been around six percent on long term, um, but the Federal Reserve has artificially kept those rates much lower since the 2008 financial crisis. We've been between uh, a quarter and a half a percent. Uh, the Fed Chair Janet Yellen told the Joint Market Committee last week that a rate hike would be coming quote relatively soon, and according to the trading of federal funds futures contracts, 100 percent of traders believe that a push to a half to three quarters of a percent will come in December. Um, and about 66% are betting that the rate will be between three quarters of a percent and one and a half percent by September of next year. Um, now, if the Federal Reserve were to ever get the interest rate even back to like 5%, once the national debt has reached $21 trillion, U.S. taxpayers would be paying more than $1 trillion in interest alone every year. That's uh, more than, that's about what's taken in income taxes. So basically all the income tax, personal income tax. Right. That would be going just to pay the debt. Well, in the article that we're citing, one of the articles we're citing, and of course we always have our links up on uh, neocashradio.com, uh, the article points out, it is really, quote, it is really, really hard to spend a trillion dollars. For example, if you were alive when Jesus was allegedly born and you'd spent a million dollars every single day since that time, you still would not have spent a trillion dollars by now. Wow. I mean, that, that is a huge point. And, and you know, mo- most of this, of course, the, the you, you mentioned empire, and I think that's, as far as the future of money is today is concerned, the United States is spending abroad with wherever their military is, right? And then the resources to resupply them, the resources to, to uh, do everything from take care of these people to the buildings, to the machines, the planes, all that stuff, right? Huge amounts of expenditures. Now the gas they use to move things around. Like the amount of money to maintain this, it, it's, not, it's not at all unusual to see these numbers, yeah. And when you consider the military, now here in the United States, as, as far as the continental, you know, there's really not much spending that you can see. Well, and it shows you where their priorities are because the defense budget has been shown to be more than adequate. The U.S. defense budget, what it spends every year, is more than adequate to be able to provide food for everyone. You know, it's ridiculous. And I'm not condoning or, or uh, saying that's what should be done with uh, anyone's money. But it's just an example of showing you where the priorities are with the administrations that we've had here. Yep. Um, and uh, the last thing here is that uh, the Fed ch- chair Yellen also noted that the national debt is around 77% of the United States gross domestic product. And uh, she said, quote, the long run deficit probably needs to be kept in mind. I'm going to say that one more time for everyone. The long run deficit probably needs to be kept in mind. There's not a lot of fiscal space should a shock to the economy occur. So, well, I, I, what I what I'm really curious about is is just how many of these bonds are held by the Fed. Okay, so how many of these treasuries does the Fed holding on to? That's what I'm wondering. Because right. all the other ones are held by private people or or other governments or whatever banks, or other uh, banks, right? Uh, over eleven trillion, I believe, are held by, held by foreign interests. Okay, uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, so so less than nine trillion are held by the Fed, but now, certainly the Fed has bought a lot recently with the QE. Wow. Well, well, we have we have so much. This is obviously a very important and huge story, but of course, there's other big important stories to talk about. So let's get right into them. But talk about President Elect Trump. 
And what he's planning to do, and he's made it very vocal, at least the uh, TPP, or TT, or yes, Trans Pacific Partnership, Randy, that he's he's not a fan of it. Yeah, day one, he wants to cut it out. Day one, um, so he he's been a little busy filling his cabinet with uh, war hungry Islamophobes. But in the midst of all that, he's also released a video uh, laying out sort of some of his plans for the first hundred days of being in office. And yeah, day one, he wants to withdraw from the Trans Pacific Partnership. And uh, there's a link here to the Ele- Electronic Frontier Foundation that lists its problems with uh, TPP that I thought were, those were of interest to me. Um, He called the TPP a potential disaster for the United States, and uh, Trump said he would negotiate, quote, fair bilateral trade deals that bring jobs and industry back to the U.S. Um, He's also holding strong on his plan to spend, here we go, this number again, $1 trillion on upgrading infrastructure, roads, bridges, tunnels, airports, all that, Uh, though it isn't clear where this funding will magically come from. And uh, in comes the Fed chief, Janet Yellen, again, indirectly expressing her concern with the proposed spending, noting that continued massive government spending would drive up inflation with employers offering higher wages to attract a limited pool of workers. They're saying that the unemployment rate is uh, down just below 5% and that really, um, you know, creating this this amount of jobs would actually uh, might could be counterproductive. Um, Trump is no fan of the Federal Reserve or Yellen. He's called her, quote, very political and said she should, quote, be ashamed of herself back in September. Um, But as soon as he's inaugurated, he is able to actually submit nominations for two vacant Fed governor seats, as well as for the vice chair of supervision, which is a powerful position that oversees the nation's biggest banks. Uh, Yellen's term as chair is actually set to end in February 2018, quickly followed by the end of Stanley Fisher's vice chairmanship in June 2018 which leaves President Trump responsible for filling four of the seven Federal Reserve governor chairs during his four-year term. Wow. And then, of course, you you factor in the Supreme Court. That's, I mean, there's one vacant seat right now, and, of course, speculation about one or even two or three more coming because of old age and, and health and whatnot. So... Well, Trump is in the news for a lot of different reasons, too. And, and being in New York City, the one of the most busiest places in the world, he's causing quite a lot of expenses with the New York City Police Department. In fact, they're paying, they're allegedly paying over a million dollars a day to protect Trump, his wife, his aides, his children, grandchildren, and all the security detail required as required be, because of the Secret Service obligations. So, and, and Trump, of course, you know, we had talked about Trump early uh, in the show's history and what I thought he would do as a president and go around grandstanding and, and, and basically parading around. He's doing that in New York City and shutting down the Lincoln Tunnel so he can, during rush hour so he can go to New, York, uh, New Jersey instead of playing, taking helicopters. You, like, Randy, we were talking about this earlier and asked me, doesn't he have helicopters? Can a helicopter land on Trump Tower? Can't he just take a helicopter above the city instead of disturbing everybody's traffic routine? But it gets worse than that because they're shutting down streets around his Trump Tower as well. So it's, it's incredible to know that this uh, public servant, or soon-to-be public servant, is basically causing everybody around him to have a much more difficult commute because of his security needs. And he doesn't want to leave there. He's planning to stay there throughout this uh, this pre-inauguration term, of this transition period. He's going to be dividing his time. At, uh, well, his, his family his is wife, Yeah, there. his wife and kid are going to finish out the school year. And yeah, he's going to be dividing his time between both places. I don't think that's fair to the New York Police Department, honestly. I mean... Well, they get re- reimbursed. Well, like, maybe they're happy about it, but... Well, here's, a, here's as, as I'm sitting here critically thinking about this, as, as I try to do most things, I'm thinking what would cost a million dollars a day for them to do? I mean, it's not like they're people. using... People. Yeah, people, okay. People. They're, not, they're not using resources. It's not like they're using some material that they have to re- re- resupply. It's not like they're using up bullets every day and, and whatnot. No, I hope so not. So it's all man hours. It's all overtime hours. Yeah. Okay? Well, yeah. It's double time and, oh, it's triple time because he's the president. So now all of a sudden... I don't know what it's what the actual numbers are, right? But I'm sure because you're you're serving in capacity of the president, they want you to perform extra well, so they incentivize you even further, right? That's mm-hmm. usually how these things work. And, and and like yeah, so what if what if you have some cop making two hundred dollars an hour to protect Trump? Stand there to stand there to stand there. That's to all just they stand do. Stand there 
they stand there. Yeah. It's insulting. There's just there's like cameras. all the cops that are at the construction zones. Yeah. It's a waste of money. What their cars running, you know, because well, they can't shut a, them off. If I had a bodyguard and he stood there, that'd be all right. But but, <laughs> but, but you wouldn't make like, other people pay for it. Yeah, like, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I can't make you pay for my certainly bodyguard. not a million dollars a day. No, not like like hundreds of bodyguards. Well, I wouldn't be spending that much on a bodyguard. But, <laughs> yeah, that that th- uh, Lincoln Tunnel to anyone who's not had that awful drive from New York to New Jersey, especially on a Friday afternoon during rush hour, to think that that whole thing would then be closed down so Trump could get through, like. That's it's insulting. It's, yeah, uh, it is and, tremendous amount of hubris, I believe. Well, and, and and the other insulting thing from this story for me was also what you said about the reimbursements earlier, JJ. This is, I guess, you know, sort of business as usual. Whenever they have heads of state visit to the UN building mm-hmm. or whatever like that, uh, the NYPD New York can ask for reimbursements from the federal government, which of course is actually just U.S. taxpayers. So, uh, but in the fiscal year 2016, ending June 30th. NYC received $26 million, about a half a million dollars per week to protect heads of state. I work on a college campus, or I have often worked on college campuses, and anytime any of these people come through, I always try not to be on campus. It's it, it's just, an, it's not very happy time to be on campus. Even when Chelsea came, it was just like, okay, I want to be gone. It seems like it, it's it'd be a really... I mean, it's just a big hassle for everybody that has nothing to do with this person being there. Right. You know? Well, hey, let's let's get to our next story here. We're talking about Russia and gold. Uh, pretty big story, seeing as the price of gold yeah, is down. Yeah, so Russia has uh, added a record 1.3 million ounces of gold uh, during October alone, and that's 1.3 million ounces of gold to their banks, their reserves. So, wow. uh, yeah, so that that brings their total uh, reserves that they claim to 50.9 million ounces, or over 1,500 tons of gold. So that's that's pretty amazing. And so what what uh, banks buying gold? And this is and it's not just Russia. Other banks too are buying uh, significant amounts of gold. And so what this would signal uh, to to somebody observing is basically there might be a little bit of concern about traditional currencies because they Russia's not buying dollars. They're not buying all these other things. And yes, I would say. Uh, dollar, it's not very clear what dollars will do when there's a regime change in the U.S. But um, so it makes sense to buy something else. Well, and Russia is uh, actually using some of those U.S. Treasury b- debt bonds to to purchase this gold, and they're mining a lot of it. They're one right. of the biggest. So they're this the central bank is buying it from these mining mm-hmm. companies in Russia, but a lot of it is domestic. But yeah, in addition to using Russian state rubles, uh, they are using. Uh, U.S. Treasury debt, right, and, to, to purchase the gold. They're and, selling those off to purchase gold. So basically, that just signals that there's at least these banks and these uh, major players in the uh, in the f- world financial scene consider there to be uh, some unknown risky stuff happening uh, with uh, traditional currencies. Well, wow, it's it's always important to note because gold has been the reserve currency of the world forever. Right. As well, far as, since since 1913, or, well, or up to 1913, yeah. Oh, it's also funny <laughs> the the gold bubble. We we covered a story about that not too long ago. But I wonder wonder if uh, the gold bubble's popped now that it's down below twelve twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and Russia's gold reserves are triple what they were about a decade ago. And uh, there's definitely been some speculation, and I, I think you guys have talked about it before as well. But there's rumors going about that if you know Russia and and China combined. Uh, their gold reserves to form a gold-backed currency. It, it could definitely compete with uh, with the dollar. Um, and Russia now has the sixth highest amount of gold reserves in the world. And it's definitely clear that they're they're buying up more. So well, we have talked about the new development bank based out of Shanghai, the BRICS nations bank that they're working on. So uh, we'll obviously report on whatever news we can find about that as it comes. But now we're talking about a different sort of bank. And back to the Fed, their enforcement arm, the IRS, is looking to Coinbase for customer records. The Department of Just Mis- Justice... <laughs> just missed. Justice. <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm sorry. That was just stuttering. Anyway, on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service, has filed paperwork in federal court requesting the identities of Coinbase customers. The blanket, quote, John Doe, unquote, summons is uh, pretty much a fishing expedition rather than any sort of targeted investigation. And in a blog post on Coinbase, they say uh, they're... 
Quote, we are extremely concerned with the indiscriminate breadth of the government's request and that they, quote, in its current form, we will oppose the government's petition in court. All right. Good for them. Yeah. Because I, I know there was a lot of hype surrounding the initial article and a lot of people like, oh, my God, Coinbase, the sky is falling. But, well, uh, I mean, the Coinbase is doing as much as they can. you would expect them to do. You're not going to expect them to uh, dis, uh, n- not comply with a court order, but uh, asking, actually taking it to court and requiring a court order, uh, th- that's, that's what I would consider a, uh, a company that, that respects its customers and respects its customers' privacy and safety uh, would do. Yeah, yes, so. it's nice to know they didn't just you know bend over right away and that they're they're fighting it a bit. Right. I mean, usually the government should have to prove that there has been a crime committed, and usually if a crime's been committed, there's somebody who's committed that crime, so they should be able to ask Coinbase for specific people's records. Right. Exactly. And uh, we're we'll, we'll staying on the Bitcoin topic here because uh, we're talking about the Bitcoin mempool. And of this, like as I'm speaking here, watching the uh, the unconfirmed transactions, just checking with the blockchain.info number, it's 63,500 plus unconfirmed transactions. And the mempool size itself is over 40, like it's 43 million bytes. Yeah. So... So just for an example, it's it's let's say it's uh, forty megabytes in size, and the average block time currently right now is about nine point three minutes. So it would take about forty blocks to clear the mempool, just to get all those transactions confirmed and in a block, and that's if every single block was full, and that would take longer than six hours just for what's in the mempool right now, right? Yeah. So the uh, we've talked about the mempool on the show for a while. This is not a new ph- phenomenon, and the last time such a peak in mempool size occurred was July of this year, and for a period of about two weeks, the mempool fluctuated wildly, uh, reaching going all the way back down to pretty much an empty pool, and then nearly as high again. So, uh, but the the important thing to note right now is that this is the holiday shopping season in the Western culture. Okay, so so. Like anyone in the United States and probably in Europe and, and you know, many parts of the world, of course, are celebrating different festivals around this time. Uh, India has their wedding season just starting, as yep. we've talked about. Um, Black Friday is happening this Friday. Oh, goody. So this week is a big Stay cyber, home. Stay cyber home. sale. And then Cyber <laughs> Monday, of course, is the following Monday. And Bitcoin was made for this sort of thing, internet shopping. Internet transactions where the fee is really small, it's really efficient, it's really quick, but with the current mempool problem, you're going to have It's not really a, small. It's not, the fee is not small right now yeah. at all. In, in fact, if you want to get your transaction in a block right now, I'm imagining you're paying quite a bit. I mean, last time I made, made a transaction, I think I paid a 10 cent fee, and that was with uh, mycelium, which and I did the average or whatever, the regular fee rate. So, I uh, I sent somebody twenty bucks the other day and paid fifteen cents. It was uh, for Bardo Farm, some friends of ours. Wow. Yeah. Well, the uh, the seven day average uh, has been moving between three and four megabytes in size. So that's obviously three or four blocks worth of transactions that are waiting to be confirmed. And this recent spike started on the twentieth, and it's it's if you are, if you're looking at the the actual size and and whatnot. Um, the, the it's really fluctuating a lot. You know, as as more blocks get created, they're trying to slim it down. But as I said, this is the beginning of the shopping season, so this doesn't bode well for for Bitcoin as far as getting your transaction d- finished in Bitcoin or enticing a lot of new people come on try to come on board right now, and they're looking at all of a sudden transaction fees of seventy five cents a dollar come you know December because the mempool is full. And long wait times. Well, with the release of SegWit, the clock is ticking for Bitcoin Core. So their their solution, of course, is to change how the block is written, how the block is, is created and, and then distributed, so that you have two parts inside of one block, and then it's a soft fork to use this new system. Is there. it, though? Right. Well, 
With the release of SegWit, the clock is ticking on the Hong Kong hard fork for Bitcoin Core. Chinese miners agreed to support only Bitcoin Core code pending a plan for a hard fork with an increase in block size. Now, this occurred back in February. That agreement is set to last until SegWit's release plus three months, giving Core about 10 weeks or so left to propose a hard fork. Now, one of those Chinese mining that has, of course, said, uh, you know, through another person has expressed uh, support for the Bitcoin Unlimited was Bitmain, Antpool. Mm-hmm. And they're still signaling support for uh, Core, right? Okay. So as far as they're, they're only using Core software, I don't think they're actually signaling SegWit support, but according to their agreement, they only need to use the Core's uh, software. Okay. So they can't use Bitcoin Unlimited. So the what this really is telling me is that all of these Chinese miners, because all of them, according to this agreement, they want larger blocks. They want a hard fork. That is that is so. In February, during that the big debate, as as the heat was raging, the uh, Suave Bitcoin Core team met with the Chinese miners in a joint meeting, and they had them sign an agreement that they wouldn't cause a fuss until three months after SegWit. And, of course, in, what, less than a month after SegWit, the signaling started, and they were hoping, of course, to get that signaling, have two months' worth of time before uh, the signal needed to be, you know, finished, and then by the time they could actually say something, right, their time, the time was up, SegWit was, it was active, soft fork happened. So right now there is no hard fork solution. Okay. Right now the the Chinese miners are I I believe honorably well some some would say F two F two pool has broken this agreement but the other ones let's say are honorably waiting until that that period of time happens but I imagine and I'm going to try to find the exact date for the next upcoming shows I'm going to watch as a countdown for Bitcoin Unlimited. Okay. That's that's my sort of prediction. And now I'm not speculating about the price of Bitcoin. I'm not speculating about anything like that. But the prediction of what's going to happen is that on that date or around that or shortly after that date, I should say, that a, a solution will not be that, that the core will fail to meet its end of that bargain or fail to meet it suitably. And the Chinese miners will signal Bitcoin Unlimited. Well, and for anyone who wants to kind of catch up on any of this, we did have an interview with uh, Roger Veer about Bitcoin Unlimited uh, back at the end of October, <clears throat> excuse me, October 21st, in between episode 178 and 179. And you could definitely download that and listen to it on neocashradio.com. It's also one of our most viewed uh, videos on our YouTube channel. Yeehaw. Excellent. So uh, let's move on. More Bitcoin news. The tipping service change tip is going to shut down. Yeah, so anyone who's been on uh, Reddit or any other number of social media sites, but that's where I came uh, aware of ChangeTip. It was basically a system that allowed people to send micropayments through social media. If you changed the, if you, I'm sorry, if you mentioned the at ChangeTip account, along with the desired tip amount on Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, Tumblr, GitHub, Slack, and others, uh, you could basically turn your like or upvote into an actual method of financial appreciation by sending that amount of Bitcoin. And it actually helped probably quite a few people learn about Bitcoin. Uh, Unfortunately, the Change Tip founder, Nick Sullivan, took to Reddit to announce that the popular service would be shutting down at the end of this month, though the site will remain in withdrawal-only mode, quote, for a couple months so that users can collect their funds or donate them to charity. Um, It's been around since 2014, and they were able to raise about $5 million in funding. Um, But they struggled to find a buyer... And they struggled to find continued funding. Apparently, they almost ran out of funds in January of this year. Um, but Airbnb acquired their engineering team in April of this year for $1.25 million. Uh, but the company was still unable to find a buyer for its code base or their other assets. Uh, so their only option going forward was to shut it down. Uh, Sullivan closed with this statement. We want to extend a very special thanks to our entire community. We are truly humbled by your generosity and your philanthropic spirit. It was a great adventure, and we're proud of what we built. We sincerely hope you enjoyed using Change Tip. Please continue to spread the mission of generosity, gratitude, and appreciation all over the web. Wow, that's really interesting. It's, it's so 
I mean, they they got five million dollars of funding. They yeah. were semi popular and useful, but they just didn't have a way of making money. I didn't quite get that either, because especially if it's a little thing that sends a tip to people, you think you'd just have the per like the right percentage of that eked out for yourself to make that just or or you know or every it, percentage of deposit or percentage of withdrawal. Or, yeah, and it yeah. was it's a bot largely anyway, so I don't. You know, I imagine there was some overhead, but what? What? what I, I don't know what adds up to five million dollars in two years. How did you spend five million dollars? What did you spend five million dollars? People. On? <laughs> I mean, people are expensive. Okay, I agree <laughs> that. But uh, in two yeah, years, it did, Yeah, it seems like there was a bad business model in this, and if if people were actually investing, whoever the board was should have spoke up earlier. Yeah, but it's, I guess it's cool that Airbnb got uh, some employees that are knowledgeable about blockchain and, well, and, and cryptocurrency. And a, a fairly successful company. I mean, not successful financially, but they made a product that, that worked. And yeah, it was successful as yeah, change the world. Type well, let's thing. talk uh, talk about a new product. Uh, now we've mentioned Overstock's T zero before, and it was it was definitely a story we were proud of and happy because uh, Patrick Byrne was. Um, a speaker in a local convention here in New Hampshire two years ago, I believe. And anyway, we've been talking about uh, Overstock for a while. There isn't a lot of, you know, I think punchy news. There's there's news, little things happening. But but Randy, this Keystone Capital Corporation, what is this about? Yeah, so Overstock last year announced T Zero, which is basically a way to sell uh, traditional stocks, but with a blockchain taking care of the the post trade processes to sort of remove financial middlemen um, and hopefully make things, you, you should be able to do a lot more with this technology. I imagine like proxy voting and or voting in any kind of shareholder meetings and stuff will be made that much easier and that much more reliable because of this um, of, of ability to have all of this information stored and recorded on a blockchain. So um, Overstock is now going to actually start shelling, selling their shares um, next month using T0's blockchain technology. They're going to be issuing 2 million shares of their Series A preferred stock um, using T0's blockchain technology. And, of course, we're not uh, advising anyone to buy or sell or do any of that kind of stuff, just relaying information. But the maximum price of these overstock shares will be $15.68. Um, and then after taking out a fee from each, it, uh, from the from the broker trader, Overstock's going to get fourteen dollars and forty three cents per share, and so if all two million shares are sold, uh, they'll be getting twenty eight point eight six million dollars in proceeds. So um, trading is expected to begin on December fifteenth. So you will be seeing the first uh, stock shares sold on a blockchain in mid December. Well, wow. excellent, just in time for the new year or something uh, like that. Christmas, yeah, that's Hanukkah, it. Kwanzaa, right? It's well, Festivus. Don't forget Festivus. Spurious Dragon. So that's the name of Ethereum's fourth fork, and that happened this Tuesday. And if you are watching the network, you probably think there's another attack going on, or at least was maybe you were watching it earlier and you thought this, but that's part of the the, the uh, solution right now. So what the fork aimed at doing among uh, several things, one of them was clearing out millions of empty accounts that were used during the DDoS attack, attack by the uh, attacker within the Ethereum blockchain within the ethereum uh, protocol itself so these uh millions of empty accounts were basically cleared out through a uh, through part of the fork that would eliminate them if they were involved in any transaction so if there was an account that had zero balance and zero it was like a new state account so if you just created an account and you just left it sit there it looked like that um anyway so like accounts that had details or or uh, funds or whatever weren't affected it was only accounts that were in this certain state anyway uh the ethereum foundation is recommending miners set the gas limit or floor to 3.3 million depending on which one you're using um and then that'll help the clearing process for a protocol working their fourth fork there was a lot of testing to be done and a lot of testing to be done in the future with their next fork uh which metropolis will probably be a uh, fork uh, the current testnet, Morden, is getting replaced with a fresh start, introducing Ropsten. Uh, it is a new Ethereum testnet with a uh, recently launched uh, Genesis block, so it'll have a much smaller blockchain for uh, the applications we tested and run and get caught up and synced up. So it'll just help with sync times and, and things like that. Um, 
And also, an interesting note is that Vitalik has been spotted on the Ethereum Classic subreddit, giving advice for the betterment of the ETC chain. <laughs> yep. That, that, yeah, I mean, that's great, you know. <laughs> I, I, what a classy I, guy. You know what? And, and, and when ETC happened, there were people, I'm not going to name names, people within my community, and I have a very rich community of, of knowledgeable Bitcoiners and enthusiasts of the cryptocurrency, not just Bitcoin, but the... Uh, the prevailing mentality was was a lot of people were very upset at ETC and that and they you know that it should just die and disappear and whatnot. And I I think I was much more open minded about it and uh, still am. Yeah, but, but Vitalik himself has even said he doesn't care about ETC. He just cares about the technology and things like that. And so. he also cares about decentralization. That was part of his yeah. his comment was that by helping. ETC succeed, he actually was furthering his his own uh, you know preference for decentralized everything basically. Mm-hmm. So we got one last story to talk about, but it's not just a small story by any means because it's uh, expensive gas. The International Energy Agency predicts that global gasoline consumption has nearly peaked, pointing to the growing number of fuel efficient cars and electric vehicles on the road. Uh, so they're saying that basically th- this year or the next few years is going to be about as high as we get for gasoline demand. So it's not that it's going to necessarily start going down, but just as cars continue to get more efficient uh, and electric vehicles too, uh, the point of those specifically, there were less than a million electric vehicles, uh, all electric vehicles on the road last year, but that's projected to grow to over 150 million by 2040. Um, so... They're basically saying that gasoline is going to be going, you know, going away quite right. a bit in the next right. couple of decades. Yes. Now, it's not clear what's going to happen with oil demand overall. Uh, the International Energy Agency believes that the gas man- gasoline demand is peaking, but they project that overall oil demand will continue growing for several decades due to increased consumption of diesel, fuel oil, and jet fuel by shipping, trucking, aviation, um, and, and petrochemical industries. Um, but that sentiment isn't shared by everyone. And in fact, uh, this month, Simon Henry, who's the CFO of uh, Royal Dutch Shell, which is the world's second biggest energy company by market value, uh, shocked investors this month when he said that he believed overall oil demand could peak in as little as five years. Uh, either way, whichever one of those might be correct or somewhere in the middle, it's estimated that refiners will be the likely the hardest hit by this shift as many of them have spent billions of dollars over the past few decades to maximize gasoline output at the expense of these other fuels. Uh, so a lot of these refineries may have to have some very expensive work done to retool their operations to start focusing on these other distillates instead of gasoline. Yeah, that I think that's definitely right. The whole peak as far as the, the push for electrical and solar energy is greater than I think it's ever been on top of the fact that the technology has gotten to a point where which consumers actually want it. Now, you both uh, drive vehicles that have electric functions, right? You yeah. Right. Now, yours is completely electric, Randy, right. yeah. and yours is partially electric. That's true. So you both have already made that switch. Now, there's, and there's a lot of other, other consumers, especially with the hybrids. And per- they're, yeah. Maybe they're not consuming as much gas as they would with a full uh, gas vehicle, but the fact that they're using half or a quarter as yeah. much gas is definitely going to affect the marketplace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's substantial. I use half the gas I used to, and uh, I do a lot of driving. So I, I had a hybrid for several years before I switched to full electric, but uh, yeah, it, it's... I mean, it's definitely happening, and, and they're making it more and more lucrative, and certainly as more people come on board uh, with more cars and more options and, and projects that we're seeing that are going to allow autonomous self-driving vehicles that rent themselves out when you're not uh, using them. Tesla's talked about uh, their Tesla fleet doing that, and there's a company called Mobotic that I've seen that has a working prototype that looks really, really neat. And I like driving electric vehicles or partially electric vehicles as mine is. I, I like it. I, I think they drive well. They accelerate well. They uh, they do everything you need to, and and uh, there's less exhaust. and And I, I love that I don't have to fill up as much. Excellent. Well, the the future of money could certainly be in electric and electric uh, storage units, uh, uh, solar cells, and 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 one thing I I was reading this week, and something to keep your eye on too, is the future, perhaps is the EM drive that's been, a paper has finally been released by NASA talking about it. It's been peer-reviewed now. And so they're finally, they're they're confirming that this EM drive actually works. 
Now they're trying to figure out how and how to optimize it. Well, how to build it. So it's making energy out of something they don't completely understand. It breaks the current it's, laws of physics. It's Is making that correct? propulsion, and propulsion. I don't believe it's uh, thrust. It's yeah, I don't, thrust. If it's peer reviewed, it really can't break the laws of physics. It's I mean. not. What they know that it breaks the known understanding of why this is why there's momentum without pushing off of something, and they they believe it's quantum wave mechanics is is the latest thing I've read. But okay. anyway, you can find out more by, by googling it yourself. I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, if you want a, a reminder. If you'd uh, like that, to tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night, which you should, yes. uh, you should subscribe. That's the easiest way to do it. You won't miss a moment of our awesome Neocache content, which includes special episodes and bonus interviews like the one we mentioned with Roger Veer and Bitcoin Unlimited. You can do that on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Attic, and more. Just visit neocacheradio.com. This is JJ. This is Darren. And Randy. For Neocache Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.